How did I make it all these years? How did I get here this far? Through the valley and over the hill, I know it had to be God. How did I make it through the storm? How do I make it through the rain? If you want to know just how I got here, it's so easy to explain. Yeah. God grace. God's 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 grace. Said I made it this far. You never left me. You stood by my side. There's so many times I came so close. Oh, man, death tried to take me in. It's the reason I'm here. I'm not hard for me to see. In fact, he is a good God's grace. 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 Every head bowed and every eye closed. How grateful we are, O oh God, for your grace and for the ways in which you continue to pour that grace out into our lives day after day. It is because of your amazing grace that we are still here. So I pray now that Ricky might die, that Christ might speak, hide me behind the cross. May the words be heard be the words of a risen Savior who offers both spirit and life everlasting. What is in his name and for his sake that we pray. Amen. Well, it's good to be here. And welcome to the virtual worship of First Baptist Church West today. And how glad we are that you tuned in to watch us today. There's a text that I want to lift today for our scripture that is found in the Old Testament book of Nehemiah. The Old Testament book of Nehemiah chapter 2 verse 18 again thanks to our music ministry for blessing us so wonderfully Nehemiah chapter 2 verse 18 and today reading from the King James version 
This is what the text says. Then I told him of the hand of my God, which was good upon me, as also the king's word that he had spoken unto me. And they said, let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for this good work. Pray with me, if you will, for a little while today from uh, this subject, measuring our progress. Measuring our progress. When we look around the world in which we live today, it's easy to see what could be called a loss of progress. Not so long ago, there were those talking about a post-racial society after the election of Barack Obama. Yet today, many of our public schools across the land are as segregated today as they were when Brown versus Board of Education was decided 68 years ago. The racial violence that we have witnessed from Charleston to Buffalo has reminded some of us of a time when being black was enough to be dangerous no matter the circumstance. The court's possible ruling on Roe will bring other issues of privacy into question, not to mention to remove the rights of women to make decisions about their own bodies. Public debate has lost the ability to argue ideas, but it now is an appeal to the lower tendencies we give in to when guided by the fear of the other. The dream that so many saw possible in the land of the free and the home of the brave has turned into what scholar James Cone called a nightmare. And whereas some may be wringing their hands without a clue what to do in this moment, that is not the case for the church. The church was made for this moment. And in fact, history has taught us that the church has done some of its most impactful work in times of crisis. That's why we've been here 155 years. We were born out of a crisis coming out of the Civil War beginning into Reconstruction. This is the moment when theology and practice come together through the lived experiences of a community to turn the tide and move us in a direction of what can happen through human and divine partnerships. Many years ago, there were people who knew what it meant to lose progress. They had come from bondage to freedom and gave birth to a nation founded not on democratic ideas, but centered in monotheism. The nation proudly claimed their allegiance to the one true God. They enjoyed the benefits of being the people of God and they made worship and service to God the hallmark of what they did. They built all of the monuments that nations build for governance and to show to the outside world who they are and what they value. But a day came when the nation lost its way, they forgot the God that had brought them and refused to follow his covenant. So the nation failed and those that survived were carried away into exile. When their captives demanded that they sing as captors often do, they responded, how can we sing the Lord's songs in a strange land? Years passed as well as generations. And then after 70 years, they began to return home, but now their home lies in ruins. Multiple rebuilding efforts are made, but they never fully succeed. Then one day, the former cupbearer to a foreign king returns home with a burden, a vision, and a plan. Nehemiah is his name, and the actions of Nehemiah and those with him provide a wonderful indication on how to measure our progress. How do we know when we are making progress? Is it the right progress that we should be making in this moment? So just how do we measure our progress? Well, first, the first sign of progress 
is a community willing to listen. When Nehemiah arrives in Jerusalem, he goes out with a small group to assess the conditions of the city. It is not insignificant that Nehemiah makes this assessment at night. We ought to read the Bible carefully because every word is there for a reason. In the stillness of the night, Nehemiah is able to avoid the distractions that can come with the day. Sometimes the distractions are other tasks that cause our attention to be divided and the absence of focus causes us to miss what should have been obvious. Sometimes the distractions are the surrounding scenery that comes when an expanded view that daylight makes possible. My wife complains about my driving because I inherit a tradition from my father that when I'm driving to always look to the right or to the left to look at the scenery. So far, unlike my father, I don't make a habit of running off the road. But she keeps saying to me, will you please look at the road? She only says that to me during the daytime, at night, I'm laser focused. I'm watching what is in front of me, but with expanded daylight and such beautiful scenery, you can't help but sort of look around to see what is going on around you. At night, with a narrow vision, Nehemiah expects the walls of Jerusalem. At night, when imagination is heightened, and the stillness allows us to be more focused. Nehemiah makes his assessment of the conditions of Jerusalem and determines that the first need is to rebuild the walls of the city that had been torn down. Once the assessment is complete, Nehemiah calls the community together to share his vision and his plan. And the first thing he tells the community about the plan was it came as a result of his burden. The hand of God was upon him. And he talked about how God had been generous in providing the support of a foreign king to finance the rebuilding of Jerusalem. Foreign kingdoms are not in the business of rebuilding vassal nations. Foreign kingdoms see no benefit in the subjugated nations gaining autonomy. Yet this is what Cyrus does for Israel. And Nehemiah says it is because God's hand was with him. And although there had been other rebuilding efforts that had failed in the community, the community is willing to listen to Nehemiah. They, they give Nehemiah a hearing. And in doing so, they allow him to make the case of how things will be different this time. Community is able <coughs> to envision a different reality than the ruins of their current situation, all because they were willing to listen. Being willing to listen means not being closed and locked in to a past that could not see a future different from the present. The pandemic revealed many things about our nation and the ways we had to change. But one of the things that came from the pandemic was the need for trusted partners in the community. However, for healthcare providers and local governments and businesses, they learned that they had work to do to gain the community's trust so many of them began going to the community to host listening sessions, to hear from the community their challenges, their needs, but also their ability to create change at the grassroots levels, oftentimes without any outside resources. Whenever we're able to get persons together who are willing to listen it is always the first step toward progress. Lincoln had to listen to the abolitionists who said, now is the time for emancipation. The courts had to listen to a community's demand for equal citizenship. 
And this week, the U.S. soccer team had to listen to the women soccer team as they gain equal pay with the men this week in a new collective bargaining agreement. In fact, many argue that the very reason Brittany Griner is in a Russian prison is because of the unequal pay scale in the NBA and the WBA. Progress is made anytime a community is willing to listen. So they listen to what Nehemiah has to say. But the second step toward measuring progress is a community willing to work together. When the people heard what Nehemiah had to say, they responded by declaring, let us rise up and build. No single person nor group has the responsibility of leading the rebuilding effort but the entire community is engaged. You see, rebuilding will require collaboration and cooperation. There's a role for everyone in the community to play. Whereas everyone's role will not be the same, all roles are important, and each role is critical to success. Nehemiah is able to pull the community together to work together because he has a clear vision with achievable goals to be completed in a reasonable time. Let me say that again. He is able to pull the community together because he has a clear vision with reasonable goals to be completed in a reasonable amount of time. Clear vision, achievable goals in a reasonable time allows the community to pause and celebrate its accomplishments and give witness to God's faithfulness among them. Celebration and celebration moments can fuel further acts of determination on the community's part to do even more than Nehemiah may have envisioned himself. When Nehemiah returns and he mobilizes the community for change, all he wants to do is rebuild the wall. But if you keep reading the story, what you discover is after they rebuild the walls, they said, well, if we can rebuild the walls, we can rebuild cultic worship. And so we can rebuild sacrifice and we can rebuild altars. And then if we can rebuild worship, we can rebuild covenant relationships and we can show what it means to act justly with one another. And if we can rebuild that, then we can rebuild what it means to be faithful to God so that the nations of the world will see that we can be a light to the nations. But it all starts with rebuilding the wall. And because the wall is rebuilt, worship is rebuilt, governance is rebuilt, and commitment to God is reestablished. Working together, they rebuild the wall. In the progress of a community willing to work together, there is also a commitment to accountability. I love this in the text, particularly in the King James, because you only find this language in the King James. It says, so they strengthen their hands for the good work. The strengthening of hands speaks to mutual support that helps and aids, but also holds others accountable. Help me, Holy Ghost. Mutual support that helps and aids, but also holds others accountable. Holding others accountable does not mean rebuking them for their failures. No, no, no. Accountability means coming alongside of them to help them succeed. Accountability means providing a vision for why the work matters 
and it has eternal significance that will live long after they have departed. Accountability means being not just accountable to the project, but what does it mean to be accountable to God? If we are God's people and we say we are, then that means that we ought to be accountable to God. That we are act in ways that really does believe that one day we will stand in the judgment. And one day we will give an account for every deed done in that body, in this body. And on that great getting up morning that we have done what we ought to do and what we should do, we'll be able to stand there ready to give our report without any fear or without any intimidation because we've been accountable all along the way. Because the work ultimately is his work. And we are but mere laborers in a vineyard that does not belong to us. But of one who has told us that upon his return, whatever is right, I will repay. If when we are willing to work together, we provide another model of what it means to make progress. We're always making progress in the community when we're willing to work together. That's why the forces that work against us work so hard to keep us divided. Divided economically and divided by geography and divided by zip code and divided by education and divided by social status and social standing. What the forces that work against us fear most of all that one day that all of God's children might get together. Yeah. And it will not matter color or economic class, nor gender, but when all of God's children get together. Yeah. What a day of rejoicing. What a day of rejoicing, but not just rejoicing. What a day of change that will bring. Because it will usher in the righteous reign of God. Now, there is a Final sign of measuring progress as a community. It is not just listening. And it is not just being willing to collaborate and work together. But ultimately, the ultimate sign of measuring progress is a community operating under sound theology. Give me power, Holy Ghost. When the people start the work of rebuilding the wall, they start at the sheep gate. The sheep gate was the gate closest to the temple and where the animals were kept for sacrifice. The wall was built in a circular form, so they started at the sheep gate and they ended at the sheep gate. Sheep is just another word for lamb. And you do know who the lamb is that takes away the sins of the world. You do know who the lamb is that is worthy to open the book and to break the seal where no else could be found in heaven. By starting at the sheep gate, Near the temple, all progress will be measured by its proximity to God. All progress will be based upon how close we are to God. Doesn't matter if you're trying to come up with a plan. How close were you to God when you were planning? Doesn't matter how many people you get to work along with you. How close were you to God when you got them together? Doesn't matter what it is that you're planning to execute. All success will be measured by its proximity to God. The closer we are to him and being able to see him and hear him, informs us of the work that we will do and how we will seek to fulfill his will and his desires rather than our own. 
I love this proximity issue. Because it speaks of a God that is willing to draw near to us. Proximity says he who was rich became poor for us that we might be made rich in him. Proximity tells us that the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld him full of glory and full of grace and truth. Proximity says that God is always reaching out for us. But the other coin of proximity is how often are we reaching for God? That's why the Negro spiritual had proximity in mind when it said, Father, I stretch my hand to thee. <laughs> no other help I know if thou wilt withdraw thyself from me, whither shall I go? Proximity to God was what they had in mind when they declared, I love the Lord. He heard my cry and pitted my every groan. Proximity to God. When Moses got close to God, he saw a bush that burned but was not consumed. And heard a voice from that bush that sent him on a mission of a lifetime. When Isaiah got close to God, he said, I saw the Lord, and he was high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. When Hannah got close to God, she was informed that God heard her prayer, and she gave birth to a son. Proximity is not just a matter of our physical location, but it speaks to the location of our hearts. And when our hearts are near God, God will use us for his glory and our good. Now, theology, my brothers and sisters, don't be afraid of that word. For theology is not just reserved for scholars and clergy. Theology belongs to the church. That's why Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses on the doors of the church at Wittenberg that gave birth to the Protestant movement something that we call the Great Reformation. That's why Martin Luther King Jr. published his letters from a Birmingham jail to address local clergy that question his motives. That's why we have a Bible printed in the language of the people because theology belongs to the church. And we need to have deeper conversations about social justice and prophetic proclamation. We need deeper conversations on the meaning of community and how the church is meant to be a counter witness against the culture, not walking in line with it. We need deeper conversations on what it means to be the people of God and what does God expect of us as we occupy space in this world and this moment in time operating under sound theology does not give glitter and glance that draws crowds a chance, but is guided by a commitment to a faithful God. This is the story of the church, and that's why we are still here. After 155 years, we're still here, not because of glitz and glamour, but because of faithfulness. We're still here because of sacrifice and suffering and hard work and commitment that generation upon generation upon generation has given in this place to demonstrate that God is faithful and that he can be trusted. Faithfulness is always worn out over every pretender. Be thou faithful over a few things, and I'll make you ruler of many things. Be thou faithful unto death, and you shall receive a crown of life that fadeth not away. 
measuring our progress means a community willing to listen. Means a community willing to work together. But ultimately it means being a community operating under sound theology to God's glory and to our good. Let's pray. Not bricks, not budgets, not bodies are the measure of the church's faithfulness. Nor the measure of the, of the church's success. Faithfulness is measured in sacrifice service, suffering, submission. Faithfulness is measured over time through commitment and determination in the good days as well as in the dark. Thank you, Lord for sustaining us as a church for 155 years. Thank you for every witness of your goodness and of your grace. Thank you for every life that you've allowed us over that time to nurture, to inform, to pray with and over, to teach and instruct. Thank you for entrusting us with a legacy to pass on to the next generation. Help us now not to grow weary in well-doing, for you have declared that we will reap a harvest if we faint not. So keep us from the distractions of the times that we live. Keep us laser focused on you. Draw us nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. That our proximity to you might guide us, inform us, and keep us, and ultimately to deliver us in your presence. In the wonderful name of our living Lord, our risen Christ, and our soon coming King, even Jesus we pray. Amen. Well, thank you, my friends, for joining us in the virtual worship of First Baptist Church West today. Trust, pray, and hope that you were blessed, encouraged, nurtured, and yes, even challenged by this word today. We want to encourage you to continue to share with us. You can share with us as you've been doing virtually, but also know that our worship services, we return to in-person worship every Sunday at 10 a.m. is our worship service followed by Sunday school. We'd love to have you to come. If you are living outside of Charlotte and away, our virtual services will continue. But if you come to our city to visit for vacation, know that there are opportunities for you to come and worship and be with us. Again, if you're interested in supporting our ministry financially, simply go to the website, click on fbcwest.org, click the giving page, and you'll be given a number of ways in which you might be able to give to support the work that we're engaged and involved in. Our summer months is a time where we're committed to paying out mission causes, and we've supported a number of mission efforts already, but your gifts will allow us to do even more for missions in the coming days. I trust, pray, and hope that you will have a wonderful spirit-filled week and that next week I'll see you again either on the tube or in the pew at First Baptist Church West. Have a great, wonderful, powerful, and blessed week. Amen.